Hello, Houston. Yankee Clipper with Intrepid in tow has arrived on time. Are you ready for the burn status report? That's affirmative. Go ahead, Clipper. carrying President to Nixon, uh, Mrs. Nixon, their daughter, Tricia, and the official White House party. We're now advised that the rain showers are just eight miles west of us. And if they are moving at eight miles an hour, that is indeed going to be very close to a tie as to whether they get here before the launch time. can't tell what that cheering is in the background there. Sounds like a uh, <clears throat> high school cheer. Rather large group of uh, local residents. Patrick Air Force Base uh, is uh, the active headquarters of the uh, Eastern Range Command, the command that uh, controls all of the tracking stations down out into the Atlantic Ocean out to Ascension Island and beyond, out in the middle of the South Atlantic. It is the operating base from which weather ships fly from here. Rescue aircraft for these space missions not been needed. Of course, hope that they never will be, but they're on the constant alert. And this is from Patrick, where the astronauts take their rides in T-38 jet trainers in the days just before launch, as indeed have Conrad, Gordon, and Bean before the launch of Apollo 12, scheduled for this morning. 55 minutes until Apollo 12 goes up. President Nixon to be the first president to watch a launch while in office. He has been an enthusiastic supporter of the space program, perhaps not as much so as his vice president, who uh, in a grand state of ebullience immediately following the, the launch of Apollo 11 said, now on to Mars. Spacemen themselves have some doubt about on going on to Mars right now. They don't really have the technology to do it. And the uh, biomedical people are saying that they're not at all sure that we have enough knowledge to put men up for long duration flights. It would take a couple of years to go to Mars and back, do an exploration job of any real value. Uh, they want to do a lot of tests with the non, uh, with, with uh, simians, with monkeys, with apes before they send men up for that long duration. There's Mrs. Nixon, President Nixon, Tricia. Their arrival at Patrick Air Force Base. Administrator, the chief of NASA, along with the commander at Patrick Air Force Base, and the, here in the background, the voices of the small children uh, let out from school at uh, the nearby Patrick Air Force Base school.
president's not going to have too long to uh, greet the well-wishers there at Patrick Air Force Base. He's got that helicopter flight on up to uh, the Space Center, where there will be a crowd of space workers gathered to greet him. Uh, he wants to say hello to them, which is a even more particular uh, there is, there is a more particular interest in this day even than these dependents and well-wishers at Patrick Air Force Base. He's got to fly on up there and then make the uh, oh, five, six, seven minute ride on out here to the VIP area. And he's got 51 minutes to do it. Plenty of time, I guess, but none to waste. the brownies. Well, I'm glad to see you. And here are the Girl Scouts. Oh, the Girl Scouts in the back. All right. All right. Well, the uh, Space Administration had suggested uh, that perhaps the Girl Scouts might like to have an official representation here for this occasion. Uh, that invitation came after the president had uh, expressed an interest in coming down for this flight. And the Girl Scouts put out a quick uh, notice to all of their chapters across the country and got a representation from 48 states. They're all here to watch the launch. And some of them, at least, to greet the president. Looks like uh, they were given box lunches or <laughs> maybe corsages or something. The gifts look like uh, a little repast for this day uh, out at the Cape. They won't be here very long. The president's planning on flying right back to Washington after the launch. The helicopter fleet to take the president and his party on up uh, some 25 miles to the Kennedy Space Center headquarters, where it's our assumption that he'll be met by Dr. Kurt Debus, who is the head of the Kennedy Space Center. Dr. Debus has operated this center ever since we moved into man flight and has been responsible for this tremendous buildup of this truly America's moon port. This is historic ground now, up here at Merritt Island. It was once just a bog of alligators and water moccasins. It now is the place from which man first set foot, uh, set out for another planet. And this is Mr. Nixon's first visit here as president. President Kennedy was down here uh, after the uh, Glenn flight, the first U.S. manned orbital flight, but uh, he did not ever see a launch. Lyndon Johnson saw the launch of Apollo 11, but did not see any while he was still in office. And assuming that Apollo 12 goes off as scheduled, 47 and a half minutes from now, Mr. Nixon will be the first incumbent president to see a 
space launch. We don't know whether any of the Russians have ever seen, whether the Russian leaders have ever seen any of their launches. There's been no indication of it in any of their press releases, but of course that's the outstanding difference between the Russian space flights and ours, and that is the secrecy with which theirs have been conducted in the past and the openness uh, befitting the open, democratic, free press, free speech society of ours in which ours have been launched.
It is giving them considerable concern here at the Cape with 31 minutes before uh, the actual launch time. It's a race between that front reaching here and uh, getting the Apollo 12 off on the way to the moon. Dan Rather, uh, I gather you're there at the Kennedy Space Center there at helicopter side. That's that correct, uh, Walter, and it's pretty drippy out here at the moment. It's been raining for about the past 15 minutes. Uh, everyone who has one has his umbrella out, uh, has his raincoat on. As you see, the president has his raincoat on. Mrs. Nixon uh, is raincoatless, although a Secret Service man is opening up an umbrella now for both Mrs. Nixon and Trisha Nixon as they step off the helicopter. Here in the VIP area, uh, everyone is on his and her feet. The Girl Scouts behind us, Walter, a few moments ago were singing songs, uh, America the Beautiful, Up With People, and this land is my land. Mrs. Nixon and the president taking their time, working in the rain, shaking hands with those in the crowd as they walk a distance of about 35 yards from the presidential helicopter to the seats, which are in the open. They are not covered from the rain. Just underneath an American flag, those seats surrounded by young people. Now, whether some arrangement uh, can be made to give the president and the first family a cover from the rain when they get in those seats, we'll simply have to see. That is to say, some cover other than uh, umbrella. Several secret servicemen are standing by, flanking the seats uh, with umbrellas. A moment ago, four cushions were brought out just before the rain started and put uh, in the row of seats where the president is to be seated. Then as the rain started, the Secret Service men hustled in and picked up the cushions to keep them from getting rain soaked. President Nixon, as you see, uh, smiling, seems to be in an extremely good mood. If you'll recall, Walter, during the Apollo 11 shot and in the aftermath of the successful Apollo 11 shot, uh, those who saw the president both in private and in public uh, said they had seldom seen him in sense of, uh, such an up mood. And he was obviously as most of the rest of us were uh, uh, tremendously enthused in the event that we, uh, by the success of the Apollo 11 shot. The, the president and the first lady have stopped now to chat with someone in the crowd. It's not unusual for President Nixon to recognize someone uh, in a crowd and pick out someone in the crowd that he met four or five, six years ago. He has a phenomenal memory for names and faces. Occasionally, you will talk to someone who uh, will be awed by that fact, saying, uh, you know, I met this man back in 1962 or 1960 and haven't seen him since, and he picked me out of the crowd and called me by name or mentioned my hometown. The president appears to have on a brand new raincoat. A long list of VIPs are to be seated in this section. Some of them are over in the vertical assembly building, touring with Vice President Agnew at the moment. Arnold Palmer, the professional golfer. Mrs. Jack Nicholas, wife of the professional golfer. They're here. Jimmy Stewart, the actor. John Meekham, oil man and owner of the New Orleans Saints professional football team, to mention only a few who had special invitations to sit in the VIP area near the first family. Actually, the president and Mrs. Nixon uh, have made it only about a third of the distance from their helicopter to where they're supposed to be seated in the rain. The rain has uh, let up as we've been talking here. It is now a very fine mist, what the English call a mizzle. It's now falling. And if it doesn't get any worse than this, uh, Walter, the president, Mrs. Nixon, and other members of the official presidential party uh, won't get very wet considering the uh, umbrella help they have. Mrs. Nixon, about a week or 10 days ago, I guess it was, was suffering from a virus. And, uh, note that she does not have on a raincoat out here. The First Lady has not been feeling uh, quite up to car for, for a month or a month and a half. Although, uh, in the past week, we were told by spokesman on the First Lady's side of the White House that she was feeling much better, and she appeared to be uh, in very good spirits when she and the President were in Florida 
this past weekend. The White House says that President Nixon will return to Washington and be in the White House this afternoon, and that Kennedy plans still call for him to remain in the White House uh, at least through Saturday. There's been some talk of the president possibly going to Camp David, his Maryland mountain retreat, some 70 miles outside of Washington tomorrow. But all of that has been by way of speculation, I repeat. The White House says that tentative plans uh, continue to call for the president to be back in the White House this afternoon and to be there tomorrow. White House News Secretary Ronald Ziegler says he does not, I repeat, does not expect the president to have any comment to make whatsoever on the series of anti-war moratoriums and demonstrations scheduled for Washington today and tomorrow. The President and Mrs. Nixon now moving a, a bit faster along this walkway. They're walking on a slightly raised wooden walkway which leads from their helicopter landing site to the place where the first family is to be seated. The crowd is five and six deep on each side here. Admission, of course, is by uh, special credential only. Mrs. Nixon, we see, takes a deep breath, and if we read our lips correctly, said, uh, my, isn't this wonderful? And then she spots someone in the crowd she recognizes. Says hello. President Nixon using the double hand, handshake technique, working with both hands, someone hands him uh, an envelope, an Apollo 12 commemorative envelope to sign. The president signs it, says, hello, how are you? That's the president's back to the camera at the moment. Of course, his hands reaching over, shakes hands with one of the NASA employees with a white helmet on. Seems to make a special point of trying to uh, shake hands with each and every NASA employee that uh, has one of those workman hats on. Mrs. Nixon, for those of you who didn't uh, see her in color as she stepped off the aircraft, is wearing a, an aqua coat dress, black pumps. The president dressed in his, can't see under the raincoat, I uh, believe it's a blue suit, that's uh, his usual dress. Walking just in front of our microphones now at the moment, we've been instructed not to try to interview the president uh, as he walks by. White House says he simply wants to uh, talk to the people. We'll stick our microphone in and see if we can hear anything. In there. The president is chatting with people and signing. Can't pick up much of that. Uh, the president stops uh, to say hello to a pretty lady and to sign an autograph there. Mrs. Nixon preceding him. They're edging their way very slowly. The American flag, which is just above uh, the place where the president is to be seated, it is standing out, but uh, not standing out to indicate that the wind is blowing very hard. The wind appears to be a little gusty at this moment here. The mizzle continues, but it is not not a hard rain at all. Uh, Dan. Yes, Walter. Uh, I'm going to interrupt you here. We just had a uh, further word from Jack King at uh, Mission Control Center here. Uh, the weather is still giving them considerable concern as this uh, front moves in over the Cape, or toward the Cape. And as they say, it's a race between the front arriving here and the launch scheduled for 22 minutes from now. Uh, they have decided that instead of making their judgment at the 24 minute level, which has now been passed uh, by a couple of minutes, they are not going to make the decision until 10 minutes before launch or another 12 minutes from now. They have conferred with the uh, crew of the Apollo 12, astronauts Conrad Gordon and Beam, uh, who have been uh, there in their spacecraft for the last couple of hours. They have conferred with them. They agree with the procedure that they will wait until 10 minutes before launch time to make a weather decision. If that decision is uh, to delay the start of the flight, it does not mean that the flight will not go today. They have four hours and 28 minutes of window, so-called. But the flight does have to go by 3.50 p.m. Eastern time this afternoon uh, if it is to make the landing area on the moon uh, in the proper lighting conditions. And if the lighting conditions are to be proper for recovery of the spacecraft, should it uh, run into difficulty in the launch phase and to have the weather conditions proper in the Pacific for return. All of those things, uh, the lighting conditions uh, uh, in all three places, back here on Earth, uh, in the Atlantic, out on the moon, and uh, in the Pacific in the landing area, have to be right. 
That's why we have windows. If they do not get off by 3.50 this afternoon... ...did not discuss the speech, apparently, with Vice President Agnew, but he said he felt that the Vice President expe expressed it with great candor. And then the President, Ziegler said, quote, has not talked about news coverage since 1962. Presumably that was a famous California, California news conference when the president said that was his last news conference and himself delivered himself of some uh, strong thoughts about press coverage. Ziegler said he did not know who on the White House staff the vice president discussed the speech with, but Ziegler insisted the president had not seen an advanced copy. Ziegler was asked whether he personally agreed with Agnew's television criticism, and he replied, I, this is Ziegler, I don't express any feeling about news coverage as White House press secretary. The president uh, now, Herb, is up on the uh, on his uh, platform there and there's a cheer from the crowd a very wet but a happy crowd everyone hoping uh, that uh, despite this heavy rain despite the uh, heavy cloud cover that this shot will not be postponed <laughs> This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T minus 18 minutes, 40 seconds and counting. Countdown still proceeding at this time. Although it is touch and go at this time, we are still not below our minimum margins for launch. The countdown proceeding, as reported earlier, we do plan to count down to the 10 minute mark unless we get information prior to that time that would show us we could not go. Uh, the spacecraft commander, Pete Conrad, still appears to be very cheerful in the spacecraft as he reports back on the settings, the final settings of the stabilization and control system switches. These are the switch panels concerned with the propulsion system that is used in orbit and, of course, on the way to the moon for spacecraft maneuvers once the Saturn V launch vehicle has placed the spacecraft on its proper trajectory. We are conditioning the tanks of the third stage of the Saturn V launch vehicle uh, with uh, some super cold helium to prepare it uh, for engine ignition, which of course would occur during the powered phase of flight. Since that liquid hydrogen fuel must be maintained at 423 degrees below zero, we want to introduce a cold atmosphere to the tank itself and the engine chamber uh, so that that ignition will be proper when it occurs during the powered flight. Although we are uh, looking a little bad outside here at the present time, our countdown is still proceeding. We're giving reports to the astronauts on our status. They are performing their normal functions at this time as the countdown continues. Coming up in uh, several minutes, the spacecraft will go on full internal power with the fuel cells. We're now coming up on the 17-minute mark. Mark, T-minus 17 minutes and counting on Apollo 12.
This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T minus 14 minutes, 16 seconds, and counting. We are go on Apollo 12. We are aiming toward our planned liftoff at 11.22 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The countdown will continue. Our latest weather advisories are such that conditions are predicted to be acceptable for a launch attempt at 11.22 a.m. Although we do have rain in the area, our minimums are acceptable. The top of this weather front is at about 23,000 feet, and we have confirmation of very low turbulence concerned with this front. All of these matters related with many other determinations concerned with our mission rules. The launch director, Walt Caprian, has given a go to continue the count. The astronauts have been given this word. They're busy in the spacecraft at this time because the spacecraft has just gone on full internal power with the fuel cells. Up to this time, we had been sharing the load of the power of the spacecraft with the, an external power source. The astronauts also are making their final readouts on the stabilization and control system with Pete Conrad reporting back to the spacecraft test conductor, Skip Chauvin. The astronauts will arm their rotational hand controllers, those hand controllers that are used to perform the various maneuvers in space as the countdown continues. We'll be coming up shortly with some commands, uh, signals from Mission Control in Houston to assure that Houston will be able to send proper commands to the spacecraft once we have liftoff. Our countdown is proceeding 12 minutes, 42 seconds, and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
This is the Palo Saturn launch control. We've just passed the nine minute mark in our countdown. T minus eight minutes, 54 seconds and counting. Right at this point, astronaut Tom Stafford here in the firing room is talking with Pete Conrad, bringing him up to date on the weather conditions. The weather conditions as reported on the last announcement, that is we have a top of this weather front of about 23,000 feet, a very low a turbulence associated with it. Pete Conrad has just reported back, sounds good to him. Our count still proceeding at this time as uh, Pete Conway reports back to uh, Tom Stafford. At this point also, Alan Bean, uh, the lunar module pilot in the right-hand seat, has given some up-to-date readouts on the status of our fuel cells, the power system for the spacecraft, and they've been recorded by the spacecraft checkout personnel. We've taken a look at the uh, lunar module for about 20 minutes. We powered it up at the T-minus 30-minute mark in the count, powered up all systems with the four batteries in the descent stage and the two batteries in the ascent stage. Uh, the lunar module, of course, which will have the call sign Intrepid when it separates from the command module in flight. Intrepid is go at this time, and we're now powering down the instrumentation. Spacecraft test conductor Skip Chauvin now performing his status checks with the personnel in the spacecraft control room. All report go at this time. The spacecraft ready light should be coming up shortly. We are still go at this time. Seven minutes, 30 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T-minus six minutes, 30 seconds and counting. We're still proceeding satisfactorily with our countdown at this time. The emergency detection system that can warn the astronauts of difficulties during the powered flight now has gone on its automatic sequence. We have power on with the... We're listening to Launch Control, telling us that at uh, six minutes and 10 the seconds, the spacecraft ready light is on, the light is on system also and is all is going well. The countdown the continues. System is go. The astronauts now standing by in the spacecraft. Coming up shortly will be some status checks here in the firing room. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Still go with Apollo 12 at five minutes, 52 seconds and counting. Well, it doesn't look like very much, but there it is. You can hardly see it in the uh, heavy rain and the mist that has moved in there. It's a very heavy mist, I should say, across the launch area at Cape Kennedy. As you read the clock ticking away, five minutes and 30 seconds to launch before they actually get started. Jules, I'll bet you're glad you're inside. Yes, Frank, we uh, wanted to do a an O naturel launch up on our <laughs> space headquarters roof as per usual and uh, sound flight judgment prevailed, conservative mis mission planning. We elected to move down at the last minute. Uh, we would have been soaked by now as would all of other people. And there's our view of uh, pad 39 from one of the NASA this overhead Apollo cameras. Launch control, the liquid five oxygen minutes continuing. Is five, that swing arm number nine will now be coming back to its fully retracted position at the pad. Mark, the swing arm now moving back from the spacecraft as planned at the five minute mark in the count. Just before coming up on the swing arm removal, we went through our final status checks and received a loud and strong go from the mission director, Chet Lee, launch operations manager, Paul Donnelly, and launch director, Walt Caprian, responding to the request from the test supervisor. The lights now will be coming on on the abort panels of astronaut Pete Conrad. These are his Q lights for the five engines in the first stage. These five lights remain on. When we get proper thrust for liftoff, the lights go out, informing the spacecraft commander that he has good thrust beneath them. We're coming up now on the four-minute mark. Pete Conrad reports his lights are on. Spacecraft test conductor Skip Chauvin has said, have a good trip, Pete. 
Pete reported back, uh, we appreciate everything everyone has done. Four minutes and counting, still proceeding at this time. We'll be coming up on our automatic sequence at three minutes and 10 seconds in the countdown. We're going through our final Astro Launch checks at this time as the countdown continues. During these checks just now, the launch operations manager, Paul Donnelly, said to Pete Conrad, the launch team wishes you good luck. May the wind be always behind you. Pete Conrad said, thank you very much. Count still continuing. Final checks of the guidance and navigation system going on now. Pete Conrad reporting back on their status. We'll be coming up on the automatic sequence in about 10 seconds. From that time on down, we're completely automatic, leading up to 8.9, the 8.9 second mark in the count when we get the ignition sequence. Mark, firing command. Launch sequence start. We have the firing command. We're on automatic sequence. T minus three minutes and counting. T minus three. Once the automatic sequence began, we begin pressurizing those big fuel and oxidizer tanks, the overall propeller tanks, in the three stages of the Saturn V launch vehicle. This will lead us up to 8.9 seconds when the engine ignition sequence begins. The five engines in the first stage will ignite, building up 7.6 million pounds thrust total. This should occur at the zero mark in the count. We will get verification through the computer that we have proper th thrust. The hold down arms will release and we'll be off with Apollo 12. Two minutes, 20 seconds and counting at this time. And the visibility has improved just a little bit over pad 39, still not very noticeably though. 10 seconds at this time, we see that the stages are now beginning to pressurize as our countdown proceeds, coming up on the two minute mark in the count. T minus two minutes and counting, T minus two. Spacecraft commander now has placed the, the environmental control system of the spacecraft on internal. Up to this time, we've been providing external sources for the environmental control system. We've, we're checking the hydraulics of the first stage of the launch vehicle now. We are still go. One minute, 40 seconds and counting at this time. Of the uh, big tanks, a minute and a half to launch, and let's listen to the voice of Our Jack King. Board here in firing room two indicates all is still well with the countdown. Third stage tanks now pressurized as the automatic sequence continues. One minute, 15 seconds and counting. Astronaut Alan Bean has just brought the entry batteries on the main power source in the spacecraft. We've conserved those batteries up to this time. We're coming up on 60 seconds. Mark, T minus 60 seconds and counting, T minus 60. Alan Bean running up the volume on his VHF. That's his radio. We've got 50 uh, seconds and counting. 50. Well, we've we've got gone internal power with the launch vehicle. We've got our binoculars out here, but don't think we're going to be able to use them. Come on. T minus 40 seconds and counting. The spacecraft commander now performing his final function, pressing a button to align the guidance and control system of the spacecraft. Coming up on 30. Mark, T minus 30 seconds and counting, T minus 30. 25 seconds and counting, we're still proceeding. Another wave of that rain T minus sweeping 20. across the cape right now. 17 seconds, swing arm back. We have guidance internal. 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Zero. All engines running. Commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff. 11.22 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Pete Conrad reports that your program is in. Tower clear. We I'm pitching a roll program and this baby is really going. Pete. Pete Conrad reporting the roll and pitch program to put Apollo 12 on the proper course. We saw it for exactly 23 seconds. That was it. It disappeared in those clouds, but it's going well again. Look at that thing. It's going to be amazing. It is. It's going to be amazing. 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 Okay, we just lost the board of our 
gang. I don't know what happened here. We had everything in the world drop out. Roger. Plus one. Fuel cell lights and AC bus light. Fuel cell disconnect. AC bus overload one and two. Main bus A and B out. Apollo 12, Houston, try SCE to auxiliary, over. NCE to auxiliary. SCE, SCE to auxiliary. ECOM reports the readings back. Mark 1 Charlie. 1 Charlie. The flight director. Jerry Griffin taking a staging status now. Apollo 12 downrange range 17 miles. Altitude 20 miles. Apollo 12 Houston, try to reset your fuel cells now. Conrad is having trouble. He doesn't say exactly. Inboard engine out on schedule. First stage inboard en engine began to go out, but there's fuel cell. There are fuel cell problems. Uh, the flight director has told the crew to try to switch the fuel cells. Downrange 45 miles. It sounds like a lot of plugs somehow got disconnected during the takeoff. Okay. Roger, we copy, Pete. You're looking good. Good staging and good thrust on the second stage. We now have problems here. I don't know what happened. Uh, I'm not sure we can get hit by lightning. Your thrust is looking good, Pete. Okay, I have a good GDC, and Al has got the fuel cells back on, and we'll be working on our AC buses. Right, Pete, your uh, fuel cells look good down here. And that was Conrad saying he may have been hit by lightning that may have caused the electrical circuits to go out. Amen. I know. The tower gang has the way clean. It looks good. Good show, Pete. You're in mode two. Launch escape tower has been jettisoned on schedule. And uh, whatever the problem was the from lightning hitting the spacecraft, as Conrad seems to have thought it was, but there's no confirmation. They, the crew has successfully recovered and regained full electrical power. Their AC buses and the fuel cells are working. And the mission is continuing. And we've got a cycling CO2 partial pressure high, which I don't bother me particularly, and we have reset all the fuel cells, we have all the buses back on the line, and we'll just square up the platform when we get into orbit. Roger, Pete. That sounds good. Hey, that's one of the better sims, believe me. <laughs> that's Pete Conrad saying one of the better simulations they've had. We've had a couple of cardiac arrests down here, too, Pete. Taking off through the storm. Many times with that up here. Well, we've got a good uh, clock running here, and uh, correct me, I'm going to give you a mark at 4 plus 30. I've lost my event timer, and um, mark, 4 plus 30. Looks good, Pete. Okay, we're all organized again, gang. The only thing we've lost now is the ISS. Uh, our number one ball is just drifting all over the place, and we'll have to catch it later. Roger, Dick. Like that, the GNC guys think about how we're going to get that thing, because it's just drifting, it's floating. Okay, we're thinking. And <clears throat> Conrad saying that uh, they've recovered most of the systems they've lost, with the exception of their platform, uh, platform for the well, guidance the system. is right down the lines on the plot board. Altitude is 85 miles now. Houston, we won't be sending you an S-4B to COI call. Okay, understand. And uh, can you give us some good words like, uh, let's uh, uh, get the the disky, I mean the IMU calm down is rolling all over the place. Okay, Pete, uh, and if you do a mode four, it'll be on the backup. Yeah, no, I got a good uh, SCS. Okay, good show. I got a little uh, vibration of some kind. Uh, she's chugging along here, minding her own business, though. So. Okay, Pete. <clears throat> And Conrad confirming there that the, the inertial measurement unit is having problems, the, pl the pr primary platform for the guidance system. If they have to abort, which is not being contemplated as yet, if they have to abort, they'll use the backup platform. Apollo 12 downrange, 345 miles. But something came, something came unglued there during the takeoff. And they lost part of their electrical system, part of the fuel cells uh, cycled off, 
And pri the primary concern is at the plat platform. Apollo 12, Houston, level sense arm, 8 plus 3, 7, cutoff, Niner plus 1, 1. Okay, here come the gimbal motor. Those are the cutoff signals for the second stage engine burnout coming up the in a few minutes. The arm initiates the staging sequence. That will be at 8 minutes, 37 seconds. We're at 6.25 now. That Pete Conrad is one cool cookie. Losing most of his electrical systems, enough to uh, frighten a day's growth out of a man. And staying with it. That's what Mark they're paid for. Yes, 4B to orbit. Yes, 4B to orbit. The S-4B now has the capability to put the Apollo 12 spacecraft into orbit should uh, something happen to the second stage. And mission control is now trying to analyze what to do, whether to press on uh, and hope the platform will get back in uh, Apollo shape. Apollo 12, Houston, that you're right smack dab on the trajectory. Your IU is doing a beautiful job. Okay, uh, we're all chuckling up here over the lights. We all said there were so many on, we couldn't read them. <laughs> Pete Conrad saying they had so many master alarm lights on in the cockpit, they couldn't read them all at once. The essential thing is the uh, rocket is going beautifully. 57 miles now. Perfectly on trajectory, oh, perfectly on course. The and the decision will be to press on, at least for the next several minutes. And hope the platform comes back in. 100 miles. Velocity 18,417 feet per second. Center engine. Center engine out on schedule. The platform, or the, which pilots call the eight ball, or attitude uh, guidance dis display device in front of them, helps them steer the spacecraft over the Earth or even out in space. And it's essential to the mission. Houston, uh, we can start getting that platform squared away. Uh, go IMU power, stand by, and then back to on, and we'll get her caged up. And those, these are the technical experts in mission control telling the crew what to do to get the plat platform back on the money. Uh, the decision is to press on. The Apollo 12 spacecraft uh, burning perfectly. Uh, uh, Saturn V burning perfectly, we should say. OK, as soon as you can reach it, that's the way to go. And at this point, the decision drills. Houston, go for staging. Roger, we're go for staging. That's, them, that's Houston confirming, Frank, and Conrad confirming that they will go through the second stage cutoff and light the S-4B engine to put themselves into orbit. You want me to turn on the GNN power and then bring it back on, and you want me to use my IMU cage switch, is that right? Stand by on that, Pete. Jules, tell us more about this platform. Well, the platform, Frank, is a gyroscopically driven device. It looks much like the platforms used in airliners, as a matter of fact, <coughs> that the astronauts set, <coughs> excuse me, set to give the steering commands to their guidance system. Uh, it's a basic flight device common to jet aircraft and to spacecraft, and it's essential to the mission. But uh, the thinking seems to be that it's not knocked out. It was merely sent reeling, if you will, by a lightning burst or the sudden electrical failure. So resetting it is a fairly complex task. It takes. Staging. There's Conrad Roger confirming Roger second stage is uh, se separated. Okay, give us more words on the IMU now. Third stage is as lighted off okay to get them into orbit, but he wants more words on the... Velocity is 23,000 feet per second. What to do about the platform? The inertial measurement. 967 miles. That's Marine Major now Jerry Carr. We're hearing his Capcom uh, talking to Conrad. Talking. There he is now. And okay. the public affairs man you're hearing also is Jack Riley in Houston. Jules, how important is the repair of this platform to the rest of the mission? Uh, I believe, Frank, it falls into a, a mission rule, and I believe if it cannot be repaired, there'll be serious thoughts about whether to press on with the mission. I mean, it, it is essential. Uh, it is essential as a backup platform. Uh, I'm checking now on the mission rules to see whether they will indeed continue without that platform. But the thinking seems to be that it, it, it can be reset, reset yeah. recycled, you know? Now using the service propulsion system. And the other point I was going to make was that, Frank, you would not choose to abort at this point because you're so far downrange uh, at uh, 10 minutes into the mission that you're very nearly into orbit. You'd end up landing. 56 miles. Velocity is 24,157 feet per second. That's approaching. Altitude 103 miles. The spacecraft is approaching orbital velocity and speed. You're so far downrange, you'd land in the Indian Ocean. Yes. So the decision would be at this point, Frank, to, to keep the S-4B burning for the remaining minute required to get the spacecraft into orbit. Hey, I'll tell you one thing, it's a first-class ride, Houston. Conrad's saying it's a first-class ride. Kind of a rough start. Yeah. I always 
he's right there starting out behind the eight ball and get ahead. <laughs> and if they after the getting cut off at 11 minutes 35 seconds. Off one one plus three five. One one plus three five. Roger Roger. And after they got into orbit, Frank, if things couldn't be recouped, then they'd uh, elect to land early. But I think the, that platform is going to be, be recycled successfully. It's just that it all happened very fast. Oh, and how? Somewhere up there between the 1,700 feet altitude and heavier rain here at the Cape where we lost the bird. Plus three, three, Houston. Roger, Pete. As Conrad confirming, shut down on the S-4B almost exactly on the money. Two seconds short of the nominal time, uh, and that means... Uh, from every sign we can make out that they're successfully in orbit. Flight dynamics report, it looks like a good orbit. Showing velocity 25,561 feet per second. Downrange 1,450 miles. Halfway across the Atlantic toward Africa. Fido says we're go. That was Fido, the flight dynamics officer, confirming the orbit's good. Whew. Boy, a couple of cardiac arrests down here is what uh, somebody said in Houston, and I think that was fairly widespread around the rest of the country, too. And Pete Conrad said he was not sure they didn't get hit by lightning. Well, that's, uh, as I think you indicated, Jules, that's what they get paid for. They don't get paid very much for it, come to think of it, but they... Uh, they certainly reacted There's professionally. A, they got a go orbit. Haven't right, they? Frank. There's the confirmation of a go orbit. You know, it's kind of like what happened to them. It's kind of like driving down the road in your car, and all of a sudden a blinding pair of headlights hit you, and all the lights go on inside the car, and you're in a heavy rainstorm at the same time. And you have to be able to steer a straight course and keep your wits about you. It's demanding. Okay, Jules. Thank you very much. ABC's coverage of the Apollo 12. Dr. Joseph Payne. Accompanying the president, Dr. Payne is the administrator of NASA. Mrs. Nixon. And we have no uh, we have no microphones right there, so we can't pick up the words that the president is exchanging with these uh, launch crew personnel. I'm sure he's congratulating them and perhaps sharing some of his um, impressions of the liftoff with them. Do you know about how many people are in that uh, firing center? Do you have any idea? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I would say a couple of hundred. There's, it's an awful large room. Mm -hmm. Looking at that, it looks like my estimate is low, doesn't it? <laughs> they have uh, three of these firing uh, firing rooms here at uh, the launch complex. The control of the flight now is in the hands of the crews at uh, the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, so the job of... Um, these people is done. <clears throat> From the president's gestures, he obviously is talking about the uh, liftoff. It's unfortunate the cloud cover was the way it was today. He didn't get to see it very long. No. Cloud cover was about 10,000 feet, I understand, and it doesn't take that rocket long to uh, travel that distance, 10,000 feet. It's our understanding that the microphones in this room will not be open until the president reaches the area where uh, Dr. Kurt Deepus, who is in charge of the uh, Kennedy um, Space Center here at uh, Cape Kennedy, uh, is located. He's just making his way through the crowd, shaking hands. Probably discussing particular functions with some sections of the crew.
The three people who left here about um, 37 minutes ago are now well out over the Atlantic, should be approaching the west coast of Africa in their first um, revolution of the Earth. I don't know, uh, and I don't want to speculate, I don't know if this problem they encountered in the liftoff will so delay their um, flight schedule, put them behind in their activities, that they will not be able to uh, start the trip toward the moon as uh, at the time that's planned. Uh, if they didn't have too much to do, well, they can do it and catch up and still um, fire up the engines again and start toward the moon uh, during the second revolution. But if they get too far behind, they can do it in the third. This requires some adjustments. And we'll, uh, we'll have word on that as well as a number of other things later in the day. president slowly making his way through the firing center, trying to reach, uh, there is a VIP area inside the firing center, beside, behind some of those uh, uh, glass screens that you can see there. I understand from, um, Jack King that most of the uh, most of the pilots for the uh, Apollo 13 and 14 missions were in the firing center today or in the VIP area to witness the liftoff. You can see this is a large room. It's filled with the uh, now the president is in the uh, VIP area within the firing center itself. It is a large room filled with consoles where computer readouts are flashed on screens and the people in charge of uh, various functions of the flight can monitor uh, their particular areas and see that everything is going well or if it's not, relay the word. And uh, is that Dr. Devis with his back toward us? Yeah, that would... Yes, I believe it is. That's Dr. Kurt Devis, who is uh, director of the Kennedy Space Center. And the man largely responsible for much of the design of this, uh, what has been called a moon port here at Cape Kennedy. It's massive buildings, it's huge launch pads. All of the extremely advanced technology and engineering involved. Tom Stafford is, uh, is with the group. Stafford, an astronaut, as you remember. He is now the assistant chief of flight crew operations. That uh, makes him uh, number two man to Deke Slayton, who was one of the original seven astronauts, but uh, was never permitted to fly because of that. Now at Hartford. And one of the stones since the early, early days. Thank you, have as a chief. Who is the president, I believe? Well, Dr. Payne and all of you here at Cape Kennedy for this occasion, I do want to say that it's been a very great privilege to be here, and speaking for Mrs. Nixon and my daughter, who are here with me, uh, we think this trip, our trip from Washington to here, was definitely worthwhile. Uh, when I announced uh, earlier in the week that I was trying to arrange my schedule to come down, there were those who said, well, why can't you see it all on television? And it is true that I have seen some previous launches on television, but I thought I would share with you the experience of one who has never seen a launch live before and what the difference is. And I, perhaps if I may use the analogy of sports, I really believe, while I like to go to a football game, live and to feel the crowd and the rest. I really believe that you can sit at home and see a football game on television, probably see it as well or even better than you can see it by being there, because the camera will watch that team formation quarterback and will be sure you are watching the ball rather than the fake. But <clears throat> while that is true in the field of sports, of football and baseball, it simply is not true in the case of what we have just seen a few moments ago. Here, it's a sense of not just the sight and the picture, but of feeling it. 
feeling the great experience and all that has gone into it. And I would add to that by saying that coming here and coming to this room uh, brings an extra dimension to this great space launch that we've seen a moment ago. Uh, Dr. Payne, Frank Borman, and Colonel Stafford, and a lot of my friends in this uh, activity have often told me that remember that the three who were up there couldn't be there except for tens of thousands on the ground. Uh, tens of thousands of people and who sometimes may seem to be, and you may feel you're faceless, just numbers and just like these computers that we see in front of you. I do want you to know that I realize that except for what you are doing here, they couldn't be there, and they would not make this mission successful. And I think that you can be proud of the fact, and we're proud of the fact, that every one of our astronauts, when they've come to the White House, and I've had the privilege of entertaining several of them, every one of them makes the point that those on the ground, the engineers and the technicians and the scientists and all of those who work in the program, that they are really the heart of this great successful uh, experience for the American people and for all the people of the world. Uh, and finally, I simply want to say that I know there's been a lot of discussion as to what the future of the space program is. As you note, we've been discussing that in the cabinet uh, and within the administration. Uh, I do think you can be assured that in Dr. Payne and his colleagues, uh, you have men who are dedicated to this program who are making the case for it, making the case for it as against other national priorities, and making it very effectively. Uh, I leaned in the direction of the program before, after hearing what they have had to say with regard to our future plans, uh, I must say that I lean even more in that direction. Uh, announcements will be made in the future as, have the, as they have been made in the past as to the commitment of this nation to the program. And I realize that Within those in the program, between scientists and engineers and others, there are different attitudes as to what the emphasis should be, whether we should emphasize more, more exploration or more in taking the knowledge that we have already acquired and making practical applications of it. Uh, all of these matters have been brought to my attention. I can assure you every side is getting a hearing. We want to have a balanced program, but most important, we are going forward. America, the United States, is first in space. We're proud to be first in space. We don't say that in any jingoistic way. We say it because as Americans, uh, we want to give uh, the people of this country, and particularly our young people, the feeling that they're here is an area that we can concentrate for a positive goal, concentrate and be proud of being Americans proud of what we have accomplished, not only for ourselves, but for future generations and for the whole world. And in that vein, I simply want to say, I'm proud of those three men up there. I talked to them on the phone before they left, and I'm just as proud of everybody in this room and of the thousands across this country that made it possible. You're part of a great organization. The whole nation owes you a debt of gratitude, and as President of the United States, I express that debt and acknowledge it today. Thank you. President being and, applauded uh, warmly. Here is Mrs. Nixon, I think you would like to know. Uh, well, I'm, that uh, she is the woman I'm with today, at least. <laughs> and every day. Well, of course.
course, he needs our introduc introduction because he has been to several of these launches as uh, chairman of the Space Council. Uh, we're very happy to have today uh, the Vice President of the United States and Mrs. Agnew. They're over here. celebrities here, you should know. I, uh, I don't think I can see them all, but we have Senator Margaret Chase Smith of the state of Maine, a real space <laughs> enthusiast. <laughs> Senator Gurney of Florida, who told me the weather would be perfect today if I just come. We have several congressmen here. Congressman Fry, Fry from, where is he? Over there, yes. Your own congressman from this area. <laughs> congressman Fulton from Pennsylvania, also on the Space Committee. <laughs> Share for them real hard because they get your appropriations for you. Congressman Burke from that little pocket of poverty, Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> and Congressman Bill Kramer. Is he here? He must be campaigning. Well, anyway. <laughs> and then, I think, too, you would like to see the, we have the, my, the science advisor from sunny California, Lee DuBridge, over here. President Science Advisor. Well, after being an MC here, I think I'll ask for Johnny Carson's job next week. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, now the president will um, be driven by car uh, to another area where the helicopters have been um, left and take the helicopter back to Patrick Air Force Base and Air Force One back to Washington. Mr. Nixon making some impromptu remarks to the flight crew or the launch crew at the uh, firing center here at Cape Kennedy. And while he did not commit himself to any specific program for space in the future, the general tone and flavor of his remarks must have been reassuring to them. We'll be back in just a moment. Now here is a word from Gulf. Stand by now. We have data on the booster coming in from Wyoming, so we'll stand by for a call. Stand. Uh, Apollo 12, Houston, how do you read? Out and clear, how me? Roger, read you loud and clear. We've got a few words for you if you'll stand by for a minute. I imagine you have.
you guys going to be ready for the service module RCS hot fire down there in Houston? Uh, we sure will, Pete. Uh, Break, got some words for you now. Your EMOD dump uh, is still in work. Uh, we'll have some answers for you shortly on that. Uh, got a couple tests we'd like you to run while you're here over the states. Uh, you ready to copy? Apollo 12, Houston. Six flag is still set. If you will reselect Pooh, we can reset that dude. Okay, and coming at you with the hot fire. Roger, standing by. the events go, but uh, of course we didn't hear anything either. Are you telling me they fired? Uh, Apollo 12, Apollo 12, Houston, uh, best try it again, Pete. Uh, we have no telemetry on your TCPs. All we have is the electrical indication. pressures change a little bit, so it does look like they fired. Also, Neil's here, and he says uh, he didn't hear his go on in impulse either. Okay, but we can see him firing. We're getting some flashes now. Roger. Apollo 12, Apollo 12, Houston, uh, are you ready for the TLI plus 90 pad? pad follows. SPS GNN. Noun 47 is 63573. Noun 48 minus 155 plus 129. Noun 33 zero, zero, four, one, six, three, Five seven seven. Now an eighty one minus zero four three eight one plus zero 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 one plus five zero four six seven. Roll pitch and yaw is one seven niner one eight. Two, three, five, niner. Noun four four is N A. Delta V T five zero six five six six one six 
5-0-4-3-9-er. Sextant, 1-2-0-7-8-2-2-4-1. Boresight, 0-2-1. Up, 0-9-er-1. Right, 3-3. Noun six one plus zero three five zero minus zero two seven eight one EMS one one Houston, uh, that's beautiful. This has got to be one of the most proud moments of my life, I guarantee you.